Hello, and welcome to Series 4 of the Family Histories Podcast, the show for and about those of us who are sat quietly in libraries, archives, and spare rooms all around the world, tirelessly piecing together our collective social and family history. My name is Andrew Martin, I'm a family historian, and I'll be your host. In this episode, The Undead will be hearing about a man who died suddenly, but then seemingly led a secret life and we'll be trying to find clues about a 19th century Estonian wrestler and his wife before they fled to Sweden. So, put down that old passenger list, grab a cuppa, and let's meet our guest. My guest today is a Swedish genealogist who loves family history so much that she decided to become a professional DNA coach to help others to untangle those complicated DNA test results. She has also run DNA courses and webinars on researching family history in Sweden's archives. So, let's go from X and Y and answer who instead by welcoming my guest, Linda Kvist. Hey, Linda, a welcome to the Family Histories podcast. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here. I'm delighted to have you on the show and for this to be the first episode of Series 4 and for you to be the first person from Sweden as well. That's great. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Where I normally start with these interviews is to ask someone what it was that first got them interested in researching their family history. Yes, well... I actually remember exactly what day it was. It was February in uh, 2007. Okay. And uh, I had been at the dinner at my parents' house. And uh, when I was about to leave, they told me that they had started to look into genealogy. And uh, I got so interested, so I got back in- inside and we sat down and they took... Uh, out papers and show me on the computer and it took like two minutes and I was hooked <laughs> and I stayed at, uh, until midnight Wow! and go, going through this and when I got back home I started my computer and I sat up at until 4 a.m. <laughs> thinking I need to get this done tonight <laughs> and uh, oh dear <laughs> yes and we know you never get your genealogy done. So <laughs> I understood that after a couple of weeks that, um, yeah, I will. <laughs> I hope you did sleep, though, in between those two weeks. I did. I did. Good. But not much. <laughs> <laughs> Were you lucky to have lots of relatives around to help you with your research and with memories or photographs and that kind of thing? No, unfortunately not. I have the only person I ever met is my uh, paternal uh, grandmother uh, in that in that generation okay. but I had some aunts and some cousins and uh, of course I started to to uh, visit them and ask them for photos and and tell me their stories and everything like that so I could fill out the tree because in the beginning it's so easy to go as far back as you can looking for a who was the parents and who was the parents and who was the parents and just collecting dates and names. And then after a while, you realize you want to know more about all these people, find photos and see where they lived and everything, how they lived their life. Yeah, to build up the picture so you get a better understanding of them. Yes. Yes. If someone was to ask you, where is your family from? Where would you say? Uh, I would say uh, 75% of my family is from Sweden okay. and most of them from the south of Sweden. And then my maternal grandmother, she came from Estonia okay. in 1944. She and her family fled to Sweden. There came a lot of people from Estonia to Sweden uh, during the Second World War. So they came here. Okay. So she was from uh, Estonia. If you hadn't really had many relatives to provide you with information and you've got relatives who are from Estonia as well. What sort of sources were you using and what kind of records were you using? Well, here in Sweden, it is very nice to do family history because we have 
a lot of information and uh, uh, it's easy to, to go to an archive and, and say, I, I would like to see this document because they're not, not, not so much privacy. Okay. Uh, it's, it's very open. It's, it, of course, it's privacy, but uh, 70 years okay. for some records and some records, there are no privacy at all. So you could have them quite fast. So the church books, of course, is probably the first place where you start. And nowadays, there are very much that you can do online in, at, at, at your own home. You don't have to go to the library to get access. You can, you can see to do it at home. And, but of course, most part you can't do online. You have to go to the archive at some point. But like finding when people were born and when they got married and when they died or moved, that's pretty easy. Unless you have a parish where there have been a fire or the books or records have been destroyed. Sure. But I, ha I have been lucky. So not much destroyed in the places where I have been looking. But it's, it's quite easy. And in 1686, there was this law that uh, the king said to, to the priests in the parish that you will keep track of, of the people in your parish and, and note when they are born and when they move and when they get married and when they die. So that's the records that we have. And uh, we also have something called house examine rolls. Okay. So instead of having like a census every 10th year, they follow the people Every year, they, you had to to uh, show off how good you were in reading and writing and how well you know the Bible. Wow. So you can follow people almost from, from year to year. And, and when you move from one place to another, that is noted. And, and you are uh, together with your family. Then you can see all the family members and so on. So we have some really good, it's, it's really good records in, in Sweden. And how long have those records been in existence, the one where you're tracking people year by year? I think at least for a couple of hundred years, wow. back to the, to the 1700s. But of course, not in every place. And, but then you have census instead, or, or they have written down what people lived at specific farms because they wanted to know how much tax are these people going to pay. Yeah. So that's that kind of records, tax, tax records. Are they quite in-depth? Are they giving names and ages or date of births or relationships or occupations? Or... Yes, yes. In these uh, house examine roles, they have, uh, you have the whole family and you have the father and you have the wife and sons and daughters and everything. And we also have the date... Most, most of the time, perhaps not really far back, but at least in the 1800s when, or 1700s as well, what date the people are born and what date they're getting married and, and everything. So we base a lot of looking for birth dates. And then you go and look for something perhaps in the US census and, and you get like, yeah, I was 26 at my last birthday. <laughs> So uh, that's uh, that's kind of hard for for a Swede to understand that. Well, they don't have to actually have been twenty six. They could have been twenty seven or twenty five. Yeah. But uh, here we have uh, quite good with birth dates. But of course, sometimes they have miswritten or or when they moved to another place or they got mixed up with other dates with siblings in the family and stuff like that. So it's not always correct, but most of the time. And sometimes, of course, it's hard to read, but, but a lot of this based on, on birth dates. I'm really envious of those. <laughs> yes. <laughs> for those records to go back so far. When I'm researching my tree uh, for census records, the kind of useful modern censuses that within England and Wales are kind of back to 1841. And then earlier to about, I think it's 1801, it's more like a head count. But to find those really in-depth records elsewhere to be, you know, just so in-depth is, is amazing. I'm really envious. I wish my ancestors had been Swedish. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then, of course, if, if you had done a crime or, or anything like that, then there would, there would be a little note next to your name. <laughs> 
so that then you know that then you can go and look into uh, to the to the court uh, documents and find what they have done and and uh, read more about them and, and read about the witnesses and 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 a lot of can get that kind of stories as well or if they were blind or deaf or if they were poor then they often wrote that out as well and occupations. Are these records transcribed or digitized, um, or are these ones where you have to go and visit your archive to see them? No, they they are digitized. Okay. And uh, there is also a company called Archive Digital that also does index them. So when I started, I was used to like flip through 300 pages <laughs> and now it's much easier because you can do a search and you you will find uh, uh, that, that person in perhaps 15 different places and uh, you can follow them much easier than before when I started in 2007. <laughs> that certainly sounds much faster now then. Yeah. <laughs> is family history particularly popular in Sweden? It is quite popular, uh, I think. Uh, we have the shows like Who Do You Think You Are and uh, mm -hmm. uh, The Swedish Version. And uh, we also have a show called uh, The Big Swedish Adventure, where there are people from the US coming here that doesn't know anything about their Swedish roots. Okay. And uh, they get to learn about Swedish habits and how life was in Sweden. And they get to have their special day and they will get their family history. And of course, there is a competition and the last one that's left will win a, a family reunion with the people uh, that they are related to here in Sweden. So that's a quite popular show as well. Sounds good fun. Yeah. Um, so you are a DNA research Coach, yes. Yeah. And you've created lots of online courses and uh, you're using your skills professionally. What inspired you to, to do that? Well, I, I've been into IT and tech for like 25 years. So when I heard about the DNA tests, I thought this is cool, taking the news technology and mixing it with uh, all these old documents. That sounds like fun. So I, nice and nerdy. Yes. So I took a DNA test in 2013 and on family tree DNA and I got 50 matches. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, this is so cool. This is some relatives to me and I, I, they were not very good matches. Okay. But after a while, I discovered that my paternal grandfather was not my biological paternal grandfather. Oh, okay. So that's what the DNA told me. And I decided I wanted to find this man, but uh, there were no one left to ask. Okay. So I had to try a way to make DNA help me and learn everything about the tools and uh, how to solve a quest like that. And Doing this, I realized this is so fun and interesting and inspiring. And this is everything I want to do. I don't want to do anything else. <laughs> so in 2019, I quit my job and started my own business wow. doing uh, genealogy and uh, genetic genealogy full time. Wow. How did you pick up the, the skills and, and learn how to um, decipher the, the results? Well, I, I read a lot of blogs and uh, I listened to uh, podcasts and I, mm -hmm. I was at uh, Who Do You Think You Are in London at one time and went to lectures. But a lot of most things I learned online, watching webinars and trying. And every time there was a new tool, I tried to try it out and, and see how does this work and, and read a lot of how does DNA work and how can it help me solve a family mystery like this. Yeah, I can imagine solving that was quite motivating. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my ancestry DNA, obviously other tests are available, um, their test result for me in what they're calling an ethnicity estimate, emphasis on estimate there, um, says that I'm 16% Sweden slash Denmark for origins. Okay. When I look at my father, he is 24% Sweden and Denmark, and he's got 3% Norway as well, but that's okay. Um, 
whilst I would absolutely love to be Swedish, I have never found any ancestors outside of England, let alone the United Kingdom, in my research over, you know, hundreds of years. So is there something that maybe I'm missing? Or how should I interpret that? Uh, I, I think that uh, you shouldn't take them so seriously, actually. Okay. Because it's also how they are comparing to special reference groups. And a lot about it is how much does my DNA today compare to people living at this region today? So it, it kind of says that your DNA is very much like the people living in Sweden today. And okay. there could be perhaps a Viking or, or someone back, back in the day. So that's, that's perhaps someone came to, to your country uh, further back in time. So uh, I think for a lot of Swedes also, these estimates or uh, ethnicities don't say much really. I was wondering, what, because I've researched all these different branches and I can see that it's, you know, the, the Swedish percentage is high in my father, very low yeah. in my mother. But when I've looked back through history, there's just no, there's no paper records that are saying, you know, this person comes from outside of England, let alone the UK. Um, obviously, the paper records could not be telling the truth. There's that factor. Yeah. But there are some uh, parentage where the father is absent or isn't revealed, you know, several generations back. And I'm wondering whether it's a case of lots of ancestors have inherited bits of Swedish slash Danish DNA or what is being called that in this estimate. And it's just that because lots of people have got it and it's all coming down, I've got lots of it because I've got it from lots of different sources. And it's just something that the people within England or Great Britain or the United Kingdom have because of where they are geographically and the history that they have um, with trading or uh, settlement and that kind of thing. Yes. And, and how much did you say you had? How many percent did you say? I have 16%. 16? 16. Yeah. And, you, and your father had? 24%. Yeah. Yeah. So 24%. That, that should really be that one of his grandparents should be from from Sweden. But there's no sign. <laughs> no, no. And but but on on the other hand, when I look at mine, I I have uh, I think it's 20% Baltic. And that's correct because I have a grandmother from from Estonia. So that's correct, but but then I can also see that yeah, that that's from yeah. her. Yeah. You really should have a, a grandparent from from Sweden and, and most of the case they they don't. It's uh, it's as you said, it's a, it's it's a mix and uh, yeah, from perhaps many ancestors because that would really be easy to find. Now I believe that you also once DNA tested a non-human family member. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I tested our uh, German Shepherd. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, that wasn't with like a human DNA test. No, it wasn't. It was specifically for uh, for dogs. Okay. But it, it was quite fun because I was looking for a DNA test for, for dogs and I, I found one that sounded interesting because you could get the raw data file to download the result and that was really what I wanted. But uh, then I logged in and I discovered that, well, he got matches as well. He was, <laughs> he was like 50% related to some, some dogs that lives in the U.S. <laughs> And stuff like that. So it was quite fun. And uh, since he's a pure pure breed, that also shows that they are so uh, much alike in their DNA. So that's what is why it said it's this is your parent or your sibling because their DNA is so much alike. Yeah, but they're so. really, really not that close related. <laughs> so it gave a kind of an equivalent, a doggy version of yes. your kind of ancestry or living DNA or 23andMe yeah. where it's saying, you know, this is instead of your ethnicity, I guess, you're saying this is your dog breed. Exactly. Did it give, and I guess you've just said the US, so it must have given a, a geographic yes. result. Yeah. Yes, I got the haplogroups as well and how uh, this breed has traveled through time. 
And also, you know, some, some uh, DNA tests that we take, we can see how much Neanderthal we are. And uh, on, the, on the, my dog, I could see how much wolfiness he had in him. So that's, <laughs> it's kind of the same. Was it a lot? <laughs> no, he didn't have a lot. Okay, that's good. I wonder how many people have taken a human DNA test and put, and applied it to their pet just to see if the scientists at these companies are just paying attention enough. I'm sure, you know, Obviously, they're scientists, they'd spot it. But yeah. I wonder how many people have done that. I, I think I heard about some tried, but the dogs have different, they have more chromosomes that we, than we do, so they should be, they should discover it pretty easy, yes. <laughs> Uh, what uh, have you learnt about yourself whilst researching your family history? Well, like in the beginning, then when I was all, always looking for for coming as far, far back as possible, it's uh, I realized that, that I really wanted to know the the people uh, more. And when you do genealogy, you also realize how how small the chances are that I should exist because you, you see when all the children dies and they get uh, different diseases that that all children rise from and and you see how they are struggling and they are poor and they go to prison and uh, it's it's actually fantastic that i am i today so you, you get a bit humble and and uh, and proud of of the people that came before you that that really made it possible for, for me to be me. It's now the part of the show where my guest picks one of their most fascinatingly good, bad, or just plain ugly relatives, and then they tell us their life story. So, Linda, who are you going to introduce us to? Well, I'm going to introduce you to a man called Nils Peter Bengtsson. And uh, as you perhaps can hear, it's quite hard to say Bengtsson in, uh, or understand how Bengtsson is spelled. And uh, he was born in 1858 okay. here in Sweden. And he's not a relative of mine, but of my partner. Because when I started to do genealogy research, I wanted to find emigrants because I wanted to find people that had emigrated to the U.S. But I was always told that we don't have any people that have emigrated to the U.S. And we were at my uh, partner's parents' house and his father told me this story that his grandmother, she was born in San Francisco to Nils Peter Bengtsson and his wife Amanda. And Amanda died, and Nils and his daughter Anna were supposed to come back to Sweden. And he sent her home first because he had some paper that he needed to fix. And then when he was on the dock standing there waiting to board the ship back to Sweden, he just fell down and died on the spot. Wow. Yes, and I thought that was so interesting because... I figured this should be in the newspaper or where where and yeah. where was he buried and is there a grave today and and what happened to him but what did he die from and uh, I thought this was very interesting and I decided to to I will look into the U.S. Uh, side of genealogy and I understood as I went along that. The census that I wanted so bad, 1890, that didn't exist. Yeah. And uh, I tried to find him in 1900, and I did a lot of searches on newspapers.com to find any news article about him, and I looked in Swedish newspapers to find anything, and there was nothing about this man who had been on the dock and died. And I searched for him for so long time. And uh, I also took help from uh, other people that are, that are more experienced in searching in the US than I was. And after a while, there was this uh, guy who emailed me and said, well, I think I found him in this Swedish church in, in uh, California. 
and uh, that he became a member of. And that was in 1901, I think. And this was way after he was supposed to have died because she, he was supposed to have died before 1900. She was sent back home in uh, 1892, I think. So this was a bit strange, I thought, because she was very young when he died. And, and I, they also told the story that she got a dog. When her father died, she got a dog so that she would be not be so sad. Okay. And um, after a while, when finding this, that he was still alive in 1901, I also got a... Uh, when we visited my partner's parents, I got a photo of this man, Nils Peter, as well. And he was a very handsome man in a, in a hat. And uh, I had this photo, and I, <laughs> just like my grandfather, I'm going to find you. I'm going to find out what happened to you. <laughs> and I also did some searches in the, in the census, and I found some a man that seemed to fit, but that was so many years later, and I was so into that he died before 1900. And uh, that is something I also discovered, never never trust a family story. <laughs> and uh, I did a lot of searches, and I also call him my personal trainer for, for um, <laughs> doing genealogy in the U.S., because he, he, he taught me to... Trying to find him, he taught me to look in a lot of different places and contact the, contacting museums and uh, looking at different websites and uh, writing in different forums trying to, to get help. Sounds like it. But it turns out that he died actually on Christmas Eve in 1936. <laughs> That's quite a difference. That's, that's quite a different. And by that time, uh, his daughter, Anna, here in Sweden, she had gotten married and she had two children. So he was even a grandfather. Okay. But yes, but he never did. He didn't get married again. He lived alone, it seems like. And I thought, well, didn't people here in Sweden know that he was still alive then, I guess? But then it turns out when I look at into his siblings and his nephews and nieces that one day a uh, uh, nephew emigrates and on the passenger list it says that he's going to visit his uncle N.P. Benson in uh, San, San Jose in California. And there was only one N.P. Benson. And uh, it was this man. So this was in 1910 or 12 or something. Okay. So they know that he was alive. At least his siblings know that he was still alive because they were coming there to visit him. So this is suspicious. <laughs> yes, this is very suspicious. And uh, But it, it turns out he was, he was alive. And uh, I uh, also found a death certificate. And I ordered it, and when I got it, I did this mistake that we do in Sweden when we trust that the birth dates and ages are correct. <laughs> it says that he was way older than, than he should have been. So I just put that aside for a long, long time. And then when I took it out again, I looked at the informant, and I noticed this is the, the nephew that is the informant. Okay. So it was actually him and I guess he did he didn't exactly know how old his uncle was when he told the authorities about him so it turns out that he was alive and he lived there and I think he had some kind of farm and when I tell this story people think it's 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 quite horrible that how he could do that to his daughter and but I think she knew that he was still alive, and she told her children that uh, that he had died, and uh, because I think she inherited some money as well when he died. It was it was well known where he was, but I think she she didn't tell anyone. And uh, I also think that it was perhaps hard for him after his wife had died 
to have a, a two-year-old child in that time to take care of her herself. Perhaps he had to work and couldn't take care of her. And perhaps her grandparents wanted, uh, when their daughter had died, perhaps they wanted to have their grandchild with them back in Sweden. So that that's uh, what I think. And uh, then when I finally f- understood that it's actually this guy who died in 1936, and I looked at this photo that the family had had for all these years, I know that he should have been about... Uh, 30 something when he died and then when I look at this photo with this handsome man in in the hat I realize that there's no way this guy is 30 years old he's much older (laughs) so I had the answer in front of me almost all the time and I didn't reflect about how old he should have been when he died I just heard oh this is him and no other one no others did reflect over that this is the old He's an old man and he should have been in his 30s. So uh, don't trust those family stories always. It's curious that he would essentially start a new life. Yeah. And leave everyone behind in, in Sweden or actually send his daughter back to Sweden. Almost just to continue her life without yeah. him. That is that is very curious behavior. Yes. And if she knew, and it sounds like she inherited, so yeah. so maybe she knew and kind of wrongly inherited, perhaps from a, an official point of view, or maybe she just quietly inherited knowing that he has started this new life over yeah. in, in the US and she's going to stay in, in Sweden. That is crazy that that is that is yeah. a difficult thing to understand why they would do that yeah and, and we think when we think about it we think about it today we would never send away a two-year-old like that but it was it was different at different times back then and perhaps it was hard for him to take care of and and he didn't get married again as far as i know and he didn't have any other children so do you think it was widely known within the within the family obviously you've said the nephew knew yeah yeah because he was visiting yeah i think i think i think it was uh widely know but i think yeah like the perhaps for a generation or two and then it just got forgotten and uh, they told this story about him dying on the on the dock it was uh, perhaps a, a nice bedtime story or something Tell me about your grandfather and, and yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's quite memorable, a memorable situation yes. for someone to be so close and then they died on the on the dock. Yeah. Um, but it's also, there's also a kind of an element of kind of romanticized story in that as well, in that it's kind of the pulls of the heartstrings yeah. um, that, that he was there on the dock and, and he died. So yeah. it is you know, quite quite a story, but one that, that, I mean, you've clearly gone through the sources to try and find the, the story of yeah. this man who dies at the dock, because you would expect that to be covered. Yes, yes, exactly. And uh, yeah, so and, and I, I got so focused on that that I didn't really look at this picture and understand that this doesn't match. It wasn't a young man. No. Nope. I mean, life was hard, yes. But uh, I think yeah, but not that not that hard. Not that hard. No. <laughs> wow. I I yeah. I I really wonder what the motivation was from his point of view to to do that. That that is a big decision. Yeah, I, I've, I've been thinking a lot about it, and, and I the, the daughter went back to live with her uh, her mother's parents. So so that's that's what I I think that they wanted her back to to stay with them. Wow. Oh, it's a fascinating story. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> and thank you very much for for telling me all about Neil's secret life in the US. But I think it's now time for you to face the brick wall. Brick walls are so infuriating, right? But aren't they also a joy to work away at too? Sometimes those clues run out and we find ourselves trying to find the next piece of evidence for days, weeks, months, years. But today, 
Hopefully one of you, dear listeners, will be able to help my guests solve one of their research dead ends with a clue or a research idea. Okay, Linda, what have you got for us? Well, as you know, I had some family from Estonia and that is a brick wall for me. I thought DNA would help me, but not yet anyway. Not yet. So I am looking for... Uh, some people. I'm looking for uh, my great grandmother's parents and uh, her husband's parents. Okay. Nikolai Eduard Sek and Julia Verno, who uh, lived in Estonia and before that they lived in Skov, who now is in Russia. So, what do you know about them other than their name? Have you got some kind of dates? Yeah, yes, I, I do. I know when they got married, and I think that's a, a, a good place because I guess there would be some people around knowing them and knowing their parents. I only know that Nikolai, uh, his mother, was married sick. Okay. And uh, there always been a story that he was noble. I found no proof. Okay. And Julia's parents, I only know the the the, the names August Verno and Anna uh, Lindenberg. No dates and nothing, just the names. And you know, kind of when uh, Nikolai and Julia got married. Yes, on May 9th in 1915. And where were they married again? They were married in Pskov. Uh, it's in Russia now. It, it, had, it had been in Estonia at some part of time. So is the marriage the only reference that you have for them? I have uh, uh, their birth. They were born in uh, 1880s, both of them. And uh, But that's... Pretty much it. Julia, they, they came to Sweden with, uh, with my grandmother in, uh, in 1944. But before that, I don't know much about their background. So they lived in Sweden and they died here. Any indication of what kind of work Nikolai did? Yeah, he was, uh, uh, he was some kind of uh, treasure, perhaps at a newspaper. And he also was a wrestler because I have some nice, nice photos of him when when he flexes muscles. <laughs> Did he have like a wrestling name? I, I don't know. I don't I don't know that. Oh. I don't think so. Not what I heard. Like Nikolai the Whirlwind <laughs> yes. or something, you know. Okay, so Nik- Nikolai is a is a is a wrestler. Yes, that's interesting. Um, and you've got uh, Nikolai marrying Julia on the 9th of May, 1915, in Skov, um, it, est, uh, formerly Estonia, now Russia. Yes. Um, and they came to Sweden in 1944 with your grandmother. Yes. Okay. This sounds like it's quite a quite a tough brick wall. Yes. So uh, hopefully there are some... Uh, listeners out there who have some research ideas if they don't have uh, the answers or maybe they have some Estonian relatives and they're about to take a DNA test and uh, turn up in all the good places for some matches. Um, Whereabouts are your DNA test results in case people want to try and match with you? I'm on all all, all of them. I knew you'd say that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> family tree DNA ancestry my heritage and jet batch I haven't tested on 23 and me yet okay. and I'm also on living DNA so. there we go so if if a, a relative does happen to to uh, dribble into a tube or take a, a a swab of saliva then they're bound to uh, turn up eventually in your in one of those results um, if maybe a listener has a clue what's the best way for people to contact you they can contact me on email okay. linda at dnacoaching.com and they will find me on facebook as well just uh, look for my name linda quist and they will find my company page of course we will also put a link to your website uh, and your facebook page on the show notes for this particular episode and they can find those and the contact form at familyhistoriespodcast.com. And if you send us a message via our contact form, we'll pass that straight on to Linda. Um, and uh, my fingers are crossed for this. Whilst the listeners go hunting 
for clues, I think I might just be able to help you with solving this brick wall, but you're going to need to follow me through to my garage. Okay, let's do this. Here we are. Oh, what is the smell? Oh, I don't know, but oh, it stinks. Come here. Jandor, what are you doing? I need to use this machine. Oh, I'm just looking after my mother's hands. What? You've brought your mother's chickens from 19th century Hungary to 21st century England? Yes, she is on holiday. On holiday? Well, you can't keep them here. You don't know what germs they or I might be carrying. You could wipe out all of humanity or chickendom. You'll have to take them back. All of them. Oh, okay. <clears throat> oh, uh, right, uh, Linda. Um, uh, well, let me just brush this off. Ugh. Right, there. Take a seat. Is this thing a time machine? Yes, this thing is a highly scientific time machine. Oh, wow, this will really help in my research. That's what I hoped you'd say, but you only get one return trip. So, let's set it so that perhaps you can solve your brick wall for yourself? That's a great idea. Where was it again? Okay, it's Pskov uh, in Russia today and former Estonia. Okay, and 9th of May, 1915. Okay, we're all set. How do I get back? Ah, you'll need this temporal beacon. Just press that big button on the top and it'll zap you right back here when you're ready. Got it. Okay, here we... Get out of it. Here we go. Linda Kvist. Thank you. Good luck and ah. goodbye. Oh no, Godkuda is missing. What? We've zapped Linda and a 200-year-old chicken to 20th century Skov? No. Oh. Argentina. Oh no. The Family Histories podcast was presented and produced by me, Andrew Martin. My guest was the brilliant Linda Kvist with John Spike as Shandor Paterfi. If you've enjoyed this episode, then click subscribe to get the next one for free, or please consider leaving us a review. Thank you. Approximately no family historians were harmed in the making of this podcast.